opportunity to come and stand before you to, to proclaim the word that you have given us for this day. Open our hearts and our minds to what it is you need us to hear. Move our feet to where you need us to be, because we are your servants and we are listening. Speak, Lord, to our souls. Amen. So the full gospel text is Mark 4 for today, the lectionary, 26 through 34, and I'm just going to go ahead and read that real quick. He also said, Jesus did, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without a parable, but when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I grew up um, every summer on a farm in some way, shape, or form. My family were farmers. I think I've shared that a little bit with you. But today, as we talk about the sowing seeds, we realize that the planting season is mostly over. Most of the crops are already in the ground. We can see them just in the neighboring field here, that the corn is planted and it's growing and it's beginning its process. This is the time of year for those who farm to double down on their trust in God. And so my grandfather and my uncle still is, he is a farmer. Every year growing up, we got to go to the farm, we hang out, we get in trouble for running through the fields that were just, you know, stepping on plants that had just been played. And so my family farm raised tomatoes primarily for Heinz and for Hunts, and they raised pickles, which are cucumbers before pickles, uh, for Vlasic. And there was always an abundance. We, we mostly go up there and get all we could, and then we'd can it, and, and, and it was awesome. Uh, but there was always an abundance, no matter what, that was shared with us. But I remember a time when my grandfather had come in, and he was sitting on the couch in the river room, as my grandmother called it, and I remember asking him, I don't remember how old I was, but how long tomatoes took to grow? And he said, they take as long as they need. That's not for me to decide. And see, the thing we tend to forget about farming is that it is a vocation that is mostly in the hands of another. There are bumper crop years and there are famine years. And the farmer cannot control the season or the weather, but they continue to plant, trusting that God will do the work. And so today's gospel text also echoes that same feeling and belief. These two parables that Jesus shares with us in the reading are all about God. They are used as explanations for the kingdom of God and the kingdom that will not be stopped, that will grow and take over from something as little as a mustard seed. Jesus is making it very clear of what God can do in every situation. He's sharing with us the power that God has who can make all things grow for good. But if we aren't careful, we can make this all about us as well, right? How many times have I remember said, and you probably, I've probably even said it here, this is all about scattering seeds, right? It's all about sowing the seeds for Christ. We put a very large emphasis on the scattering and the sowing. And don't get me wrong, it's important. We are in partnership in God with God in this journey of life. We are ambassadors to the kingdom, and we are called to lift up and do all that we, in everything that we do and that we say. And yet, as I glean from these parables, more than anything else, it's not simply that we are called to scatter seeds or to plant mustard seeds. That would make the parable about us. This is not about us. Most definitely not about us. Verses 26 through 29 describe the mystery of the kingdom. So incredible is this mystery that Jesus has to use, or he does use, a parable to communicate it. The kingdom begins with scattering seed. It starts with planting and sowing. Seed falls to the ground, and for all practical purposes, it seems to have died. But soon, says the Lord, a green blade pushes its way up ever so gently out of the ground. It grows slowly, but surely. 
and night and day it grows. And the key thought in this parable is expressed in the second half of verse 27. The seeds sprout and grow, although the man doesn't know how. We do not know how. I know we try and observe it and we have an explanation that science will tell us that we have to learn about, but we don't really know why. Yet even though we don't understand this, God does. God controls the harvest. The power of the seed to germinate and to grow is power that is placed there by God. And even though we are given the task of sowing, of planting, it is God who makes it produce. It is God who yields the harvest. It's the God power, not manpower, on which the kingdom depends. And into this uncertainty, the words of Jesus come to bring that peace and security for us. When Jesus spoke these words to a people who have come out of trials and tribulations, he's speaking to them as people who remembered what God has done. The hand of deliverance coming and saving them. People who wandered a land of hot and arid deserts. People who had been enslaved and now freed. People who had been taken captive and delivered by the powerful hand of the same living God. This is the picture that Jesus wants to convey to us also with this parable. He wants to invoke the memory and the visionary impulse of Yahweh who acts to deliver his chosen ones from occupation and oppression. And folks, because the kingdom of God because the kingdom is a God thing, fueled and operating by the power of the cross, animated by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we know there is victory in overcoming. This is all about the kingdom. And more than anything, these parables are all about trust in that kingdom. See, it takes a certain aptitude to engage in a vocation where you have very little control. Farming, with all of the advances that we have today, still relies on something bigger than technology, weather. A rainy summer can wipe out the entire crop. A crop that gets no water will yield very, very little. Bless you. I remember more than once, the lower fields of our our family farm were underwater. The corn was just ruined for an entire year. And yet year after year, the seeds were continued to be sown. Because at the heart of farming and at the heart of these parables is trust. And trust comes from a faithful God who will continue to provide for his kingdom. The hard part for us is the trust. It's hard to have a faith in that which we cannot see. Why? Mostly because we have a limited perspective on what God allows us to see. It's why we call it faith. The seeds sprout and grow, although we do not know how. So I've really gone through a lot of words and a lot of explanation and a lot of trouble to make that point. So I'm going to say it again. It is a God thing. It is God power, not manpower, on which the kingdom depends. And this is amazing news for us. Because if it depended on us, we'd mess it up pretty good. But what I remember more about anything else than farming growing up is the willingness to trust in something bigger than ourselves. Because we cannot see all that God has planned. And today it is worth remembering as well. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2, However as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. See, trusting God is like sowing seeds. We have no idea what God has prepared. But like my grandfather and my uncle, they keep planting because God continued to be faithful. We don't know what God has planned for us, but if we can continue to love him and follow his son Jesus, I promise you God is preparing something greater than we are walking through right now. There's a song that I have on repeat on Spotify. Um, It's called Joy in the Morning. Probably have heard it. Some of you have heard it. But the lyrics are this. It says, everything happens for a reason, but you don't know what you don't know. And you'll never have peace if you don't let go of tomorrow. Some of you are probably singing in your head like I am, right? Because it ain't even faith till your plan falls apart, but you still choose to follow. It, if it doesn't make sense right now, it will when it's over. 
there will be joy in the morning. All right, and here's my favorite line. If it's not good, then he's not done. And he's not done with it yet. There will be joy in the morning. See, folks, God is working all things for good. We have to believe that today. We don't know why things happen the way they do, why we say things and we act that we say and we act the way we act. And yet, whatever we do and say is something that is bigger than all of us. And God can turn our mess into his message if we're willing to turn it all over to him. Before, uh, well, after Paul writes his love letter in 1 Corinthians 13, he then follows it up with this in, in verse 9. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part will disappear. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only as a reflection in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall fully know, even as I am fully known. But for people who crave knowledge, who base their understanding of life on science and things that they can see and touch, this is the biggest challenge. We think we need to see it all so that we can believe it all. And yet the lens that we look at life through can't possibly provide the full panorama of the kingdom. We know in part. We prophesy in part. We see as a poor reflection in a mirror. I know in part. It's all about the parts. Sometimes what we see is not really what it is. And that which we think we understand, we fail to grasp. And when we begin to imagine that we have a full grasp on the kingdom of God, we suddenly find ourselves in error. Because no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. So what are you walking through? God's got it. What are you stressed about? God's got it. What are you anxious about? God's got it. And we know that God's got it because the word of God tells us. See, one of the things that's true about Scripture is that in life, you're, you're never promised that you will not live a life without pain and suffering. But everywhere all over the Scriptures, you are promised that in the midst of that pain and suffering, you have a God that goes before you. No matter what you're going through, you have a God that is always with you. That is what you find in these words. And it's a reminder amidst the brokenness that we see in our lives that Jesus is filling us with hope for that which we cannot see. Paul tells us that what we see is temporary, but what God is doing in the unseen places, in the hidden spaces of the world around us, is preparing everything for that eternal glory. Paul wants us to fix our eyes on what is unseen because that's what it means to live by faith. And faith in what is not, and faith is not in what is seen, but is what is in unseen. And friends, what Paul is telling us, that the more mature your faith is, the easier it is to understand this. If you're struggling to trust God and find it very hard to believe that God has greater things in store for us, whatever we're walking through, but especially in the largest challenges of your life, then I plead with you to lean more into Jesus. Because leaning on him and growing in him will also ensure that the fruit that comes from our hearts is the right fruit for the kingdom. Um, some of you remember what the Reader's Digest is, <laughs> right? Before there were apps and phones and all that. Years ago, there was a story. Um, a company had mailed out some special advertising postcards, right? We used to do that. We don't do that as much anymore because we have email. But it had a mustard seed glued to the front of the uh, card. And the caption went along the lines of, if you have faith as small as this mustard seed in our product, you are guaranteed to get excellent results and be totally satisfied. Signed, whoever the management was. A few months later, love this, one recipient of this promotional piece wrote back to the company and said, you will be very interested to know that I planted the mustard seed that you sent on your advertising card. And it has grown into a wonderfully healthy bush producing wonderful tomatoes. Right? <laughs> 
See, sometimes we grow things we don't expect because we plant the wrong seeds. In the 70 years that my grandfather and uncle have been farming, they have never gotten a cucumber from a tomato plant. They always have reaped what they've sown. They get tomatoes from tomato seeds and cucumbers from cucumber seeds. And it works like this for us too. If we aren't sowing our lives in the word of God, we're not going to get fruit from the Spirit. If we aren't sowing our lives in prayer, we won't understand the comfort that God can provide for us. If we aren't following Jesus, doing what he did, being like him, then we will not look like Jesus to the rest of the world. You get what you sow. You cannot get a Christian life and growth from non-Christian seeds. And that's what we are trying to do today. We're okay with trying to live our lives in the bars and the parties and the video games and the porn on the internet, and then we try and cover it up with an hour on Sunday. And folks, it's not going to grow. Regardless of how you look or what you say or what you do, when the fruit matures, it's the fruit of the seed that was sown and cultivated and nurtured and fertilized. Telling someone I'm a Christian and then acting differently is like saying, I'm a mustard seed, and a tomato grows. We are known by our fruit. And if our fruit is not of the Spirit, then we cannot fault call ourselves followers of Christ. And when we stray from the intended purpose of the church, baptizing, making disciples, teaching and reaching others, we are not sowing seeds for the kingdom. And if we're not sowing seeds for the kingdom, there's going to be no growth and there will be no blessing. Because this is Christ first. Jesus first. Don't miss that. We are called to sow seeds for the kingdom. And because this is Father's Day, I'm going to end with this. Dads are not perfect. Ah, and there's no kids in the room to hear it. Darn. Dads are not perfect. Kids, if you are here, we are not perfect. We try hard. We want what's best for you, but sometimes we mess it up. There's a verse I try and live by, but I fail at it more often than not. Ephesians 6, it says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Y'all, five-year-olds are exasperating. And I'm on my sixth one. You would think I'd have it down by now, right? But I don't mean to. And there are times that I exasperate my kids. I frustrate them, I annoy them, and I forget that they are a gift to me. And I forget that God has placed them in my care to experience my love through Jesus. But I'm trying. I try to show them what it looks like to live as a man following Jesus. And with all the frustrations of raising kids, my greatest joy has actually been watching those same kids grow in the Lord. I have one daughter married to a pastor. I have another daughter married to a pastor's kid. And I have a boy in the middle in the Air Force who's a chaplain's assistant. I have three boys at home as well that I'm trying to be an example of a man of faith. And when things don't go the way I want them to or I expect them to, I try to let them see that I am still faithful to God. And I let God lead the way. Dads, we are called to sow those seeds. We're called to sow the seeds of faith first in our lives of our children. We can sow seeds of sports and fun and work and family, of course. But if we fail to sow the seeds of faith, leading by our own example, we cannot expect to get fruit of the kingdom of our kids. We reap what we sow. And there's no time to begin other than now. Show your kids what a man of faith is guided by a relationship with Jesus looks like. A humble man willing to serve them. A joyous man willing to laugh and play with them. A dedicated man willing to sacrifice the things you want to build their life and faith. A disciplined man, one willing to say no to the things in life that do not honor God. But most of all, show them a man that needs a savior. One who in his brokenness falls on his knee in prayer, and asks God to guide his steps. 
to forgive his sins and to renew his strength each and every day. Folks, we're all sowing seeds for the kingdom. What we say and what we do is simply a dim reflection of who God is to us. But God is in control. If you hear nothing else this morning, hear that God is controlling it all. It is his will and his timing and his glory to be had through it all. He's proven his faithfulness. He's proven his love by sending us his son so that all we have to do is believe in him and point people to him and let God do the work. Amen? Let us pray. God, thank you for this opportunity. We'll stand as well, folks. Thank you for the opportunity to live our lives in those hidden moments. We don't know what they hold, but we know you do. Those times where we're wanting control. Help us to just let you have that. To be faithful to those seeds that you have planted so many times. Help us to find those places in our own lives that we aren't trusting in you and to offer them to you because we only see part of our life even though we are living it. You see it all. And so we ask that you continue to do what you do, to be faithful in our lives, to show up when we need you, and above all, to continue to love us. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.